Spanning Tree Protocol is a Layer 2 protocol. It finds and removes the switching loops from the network. A switching loop occurs when two switches have more than one direct connection. If you connect two switches with a single link, the link is called the primary link. A primary link does not create a switching loop. However, if it fails, it brings the entire network down. You can avoid it by using more than one connection between switches. If you use more than one connection, all additional connections are called redundant or backup links. A backup link keeps the network running when the primary link fails. It is meaningful only when the primary link fails. If the primary link is up, it creates a switching loop. A switching loop causes three main problems, broadcast storm, unstable cam table, and waste of network bandwidth. A network never works with a switching loop. If you want to learn more about the switching loop, you can check this video. It explains how switching loops occur and how they affect the network. In this video, we will discuss and learn how STP finds and removes switching loops. We will build a practice lab on Packet Tracer. Packet Tracer is a network simulator software. Cisco developed it as a practice tool for its entry-level certification programs. You can download it from Cisco's official website or the link given in the description. Drag four switches to the workspace. You do not need any advanced switch to practice STP. STP works on all Cisco switches. Drag a PC and a server to the workspace. We will use these end devices to generate and receive broadcast frames. Connect PC to switch 1 and server to switch 2. You can use any port to connect end devices. I connected these devices to the first port of both switches. Now, let us connect switches. This switch has 2 gigabit Ethernet ports. Connect the first switch's first gigabit Ethernet port to the first gigabit Ethernet port of the second switch. Connect the second switch's second gigabit Ethernet port to the second gigabit Ethernet port of the third switch. Connect the third switch's first gigabit Ethernet port to the first gigabit Ethernet port of the fourth switch. At first, create only primary links. Primary links do not create switching loops. At this time, this network has no loops. We can verify this by sending a broadcast frame from the PC. Before we send a broadcast frame from the PC, we must assign an IP configuration on both end devices. Assign an IP address to the PC. Now, let us assign an IP address to the server from the same IP subnet. After assigning IP addresses on both end devices, let us verify the connectivity between both devices. For this, we can use the ping command. The ping command sends ICMP echo messages to the destination device. If the destination device is up, it replies to the echo messages. As we can see here, the PC is getting replies from the server. It verifies the PC and server have connectivity. By default, the ping command sends echo messages to a single host. A broadcast message belongs to all hosts on the local network. Therefore, we cannot use the ping command to send broadcast messages from the command prompt. To verify it, we can send ping requests to the local broadcast address. 255.255.255.255 is the default broadcast address of the local segment. As we can see here, the ping command fails to find the host having this address. To use the ping command to send broadcast messages, we have to use the traffic generator tool. This tool generates raw traffic for all supported applications and protocols. We can use it to send broadcast messages. Select the auto select outgoing port option. Specify the source address. Keep the default TTL and TOES values. Set the sequence number to 1 and the packet size to 64. This option sends only one broadcast frame. If a switching loop exists, only one broadcast frame is enough to create a broadcast storm. At this moment, this network has no switching loop. Since there is no loop in the network, the frame will not create any issues. Before we forward this frame, let's change the viewport mode to simulation. Simulation mode displays all movements of the packet. By default, simulation mode tracks all events of the network. Remove all events from the list. Add only ICMP in the IP4 section. It will track all ICMP events. Now, let us move back to the PC and send a broadcast frame. As we can see here, the broadcast frame has been generated. Since we are in simulation mode, this frame will not move until we start the event from here. These options allow us to control the flow of traffic. Let us start the event. The frame reaches switch 1. Since it is a broadcast frame, switch 1 forwards it from all active ports except the port on which it arrives. The frame reaches switch 2. Switch 2 repeats the same process. The frame reaches switch 3. The same thing happens at switch 3. Switch 3 forwards the frame to the switch 4. Switch 4 forwards the frame to the server. The server replies with its broadcast frame. The reply broadcast frame reaches switch 4. Switches repeat the same process. 
they forward the incoming broadcast frame from all active ports apart from the incoming port. The broadcast frame reaches the PC by following the same path in the reverse order. The conversation ends without any issue. It happens because there is no loop in the network, but if there is a loop in the network, the thing will be entirely different. Before we create a loop, let us reset the event tracker. To create a loop, we need to connect any two switches with more than one link. The first link will work as a primary link while the second link will work as a backup link. If the primary link is up, the backup link creates a loop. Connect switch 1 with switch 4. After this connection, switch 1 will have two paths to reach switch 4. By default, the STP protocol is enabled on all Cisco switches. When you add a new connection, STP checks whether the new connection creates a loop or not. If the new connection creates a loop, STP disables the connection to remove the loop. When we add a new connection to a port, the switch does not enable the port immediately. It first runs the STP algorithm to check how the new connection will work in the existing network layout. If the new connection creates a loop, it disables the port. The switch enables the port only if the new connection does not create a loop. As we can see here, STP has disabled this port to remove loops. Change the default view to simulation. Access the PC and open the traffic generator. Send a broadcast frame and start the event tracker. The frame reaches switch 1. Switch 1 forwards it to switch 2 and 4. Switch 2 drops this frame as it has no other active port to forward the frame. Switch 4 forwards it to the server and switch 3. Switch 3 forwards it switch 2. Switch 2 receives this frame on the disabled port. It discards the frame. Since switch 2 does not accept frames on this port, it does not create a loop. This way, STP breaks the loop by disabling a port from ports that cause the loop. STP actively monitors all ports. If we make any change to the physical layout, it updates the virtual layout accordingly. For example, if we manually remove a link that causes the loop or the primary link goes down, it automatically enables the backup link. STP disabled this port to remove the loop. Now that we have removed the primary link, it will automatically enable this port. But it will not happen in simulation mode. In simulation mode, all events occur based on user interaction. Change the view to real-time and wait for a few seconds. As we can see here, STP enabled this port. Now, let us suppose the primary link comes back or we add the primary link again. In that case, STP will disable this port again. As we can see here, this port has been disabled again. This way STP makes loop management completely hassle-free. It automatically detects loops in the network and disables ports to remove them. If primary links go down, it automatically enables the backup links to maintain the connectivity. Since it handles everything automatically and by default enables all Cisco switches and needs no manual configuration, you can consider it the most silent protocol running on the switches. At the same time, it is also the most crucial protocol. Without it, if a loop forms in the network, the network will not work. Let us disable STP on all switches to understand it practically. STP works on a VLAN basis. Each VLAN runs a separate STP instance. By default, all switch ports work in VLAN 1. If we disable STP on VLAN 1, it will disable STP on all ports. The no spanning tree VLAN command disables STP on the specified VLAN. If we provide 1 as an argument to this command, it will disable STP on VLAN 1. We need to run this command on all switches. It will disable STP on the entire network. Once STP is disabled, switches will start forwarding frames from all enabled ports no matter whether the enabled ports are part of a loop or not. If there is a loop on the network, they will receive forwarded broadcast frames back from other ports. Since switches always forward broadcast frames, they will forward the received frames again. It will create a never-ending broadcast storm which will bring the entire network down. It will create a never-ending loop. It will consume most of the network bandwidth. Besides this, it also makes the CAM table unstable. Switches use the source MAC address of incoming frames to build the CAM table. If there is a loop in the network, they receive the same frame from different ports. It makes their CAM tables unstable. Switches use the CAM table to make forwarding decisions. If CAM tables are not stable, switches fail to make forwarding decisions. It brings the entire network down. Let us send one more broadcast frame to see how a loop affects the network. Start the event tracker. The frame reaches switch 1. Switch 1 forwards it to switch 2 and switch 4. Switch 4 forwards it to switch 3 and the server. Switch 2 forwards the frame to switch 3 and switch 3 forwards it to switch 2. They repeat the same process for incoming frames. This cycle will never end. Right now, we are in simulation mode. In simulation mode, the packet tracer slows down the packet's movement to visualize the event. In real time, 
It happens blazing fast. To see this event in real time, clear the captured event and change the view to real time. As we can see here, switches are forwarding frames super fast. Now, let us enable the STP again on all switches and understand why STP is crucial for a functional network. Cisco switches forward frames extremely fast. They can forward millions of frames per second. It means a loop can make millions of copies of a single broadcast frame every second. All these copies will circulate in the loop indefinitely. Within a minute, there will be no room for user frames. It will bring the entire network down. STP can protect the network from this situation. Once STP is enabled on all switches, it will create a virtual topology of the entire network. After building the virtual topology of the network, it will find loops in it. If a loop exists, it will disable the ports that cause the loop. A switch port does not forward frames until it gets a green signal from STP. This entire process goes through a few steps. We use the spanning tree VLAN command to enable STP on the specified VLAN. Since we did not change or configure VLANs on this network and by default, all switch ports belong to VLAN 1, enabling STP on VLAN 1 will enable it on all ports. Now that we have enabled STP on all switches, it will find the loop and disable the port that can break the loop without breaking the connectivity. As we can see here, STP has disabled this port to remove the loop from this network. Now, let us understand how STP works. STP uses the STA algorithm to find and remove loops. STA uses BPDU messages to share information between STP running switches. Switches send BPDU messages every 2 seconds. Let us change the view to simulation mode. To view the BPDU messages, we have to add STP in the event list. STP protocol is available under the miscellaneous option. Select this to add STP in the event list. Now start the event tracker. As we can see here, switches are sending BPDU messages from all active ports. A BPDU message contains all the information STP switches need to build and maintain a virtual topology. If you want to see this information, click a BPDU message. It will display how this packet is constructed and what information it contains. As we can see here, this packet is constructed only on layers 1 and 2. To see its contents, switch to the Detail tab. This is header information. Here is the information STP needs for its operation. When we start a switch, it uses BPDU messages to learn the existing topology and select its role. After finalizing its and its port's role in the topology, it uses them to monitor the topology. If any change occurs in the network, it uses them to update its database. STP topology starts from the root bridge. A root bridge is the starting point of the STP topology. STP selects only one switch as a root bridge from all switches. For example, here we have four STP running switches. Only one of these is the root bridge. The remaining three are non-root bridge switches. To see whether a switch is a root bridge or a non-root bridge, we use the show spanning tree command in privileged exec mode. This command displays the switch's role and its port state in the STP topology. It also displays information about the root bridge. It uses two parameters to select the root bridge, the bridge priority and MAC addresses. The bridge priority is a changeable numeric value. It allows us to manipulate the root bridge selection process. The switch having the lowest bridge priority value becomes the root bridge. The default priority value is 32768. If we do not change the default priority value, STP uses the MAC addresses of all participating switches to select the root bridge. It chooses the switch having the lowest MAC address as the root bridge. Since we did not change the default priority in this network, STP used MAC addresses to select the root bridge. It selects this switch as the root bridge as it has the lowest MAC address. That's all for this video. If you have any suggestions, comments, or feedback about this video, please share them in the comment section given below.